Hello, everyone. Welcome. I'm just waiting a few more moments. I um, feel like there are more and more people coming into our virtual room here. I think it's safe to say we can we can start slowly a little bit. Um, uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, um, depending on where you are at the moment. Um, my name is uh, Sham Jaff, and I welcome you to uh, the fourth episode of our online discussion series, um, Reframing Reproduction. And today we are reframing birth. Um, Every year, the UN estimates that around 78 million children are born worldwide, 78 million children. And every day, around 810 women and birthing people um, die while giving birth or not long after. Uh, those are the figures for, um, for 2017. And for every woman or for every birthing person who dies, there are about 20 to 30 others who experience physical injury, infection, trauma, or other birth um, or pregnancy related complications. The fact that giving birth is so, or can still be so dangerous um, to one's health, that's got to do with um, a lot of structural problems. Sometimes the problem is that there is no functioning healthcare system. Um, sometimes the problem is that it is inaccessible to certain groups, um, either because hospitals or other facilities are too far away, or the infrastructure is um, lacking, or because of other barriers such as discrimination or lack of information. Whatever the reasons are for this very dangerous and fatal situation, um, it fundamentally violates the right to a safe birth. Um, so today we're going to be discussing one main question, which is what do we need so that childbirth can be self-determined, uh, safe and dignified? What do we need for a just birth culture? But before I move on to introducing our brilliant panelists today, um, there are a few things I'd like to point out before we begin. Uh, this conversation is currently being live streamed and recorded. Um, and if you are active on social media, you can tweet about it. You can, uh, we have, we use some specific hashtags uh, for this event. We will share them in the chat um, or have shared them in the chat. And um, you can collect your feedback and thoughts um, on this topic and, and feel free to tweet about it. Um, you are most welcome also to engage in the chat throughout the entire panel discussion. Um, in the very last 30 minutes of our um, conversation, we will officially open up the floor for questions and feedback, but you can post your questions during um, the panel discussion as well. Also, please treat the chat not only as a place for your questions or for your feedback and comments, you can also use it as a virtual living room, kind of, where you get to meet and greet other like-minded people, um, a, a digital place where you can talk about your current projects uh, with one another, ideally related to, to, to the topic of today's panel or the entire discussion series. Um, these events are, as virtual as they are, um, their chat functions uh, can be a blessing for network dynamics, so please use it. Um, also, the Heinrich Böll Stiftung has um, generously made translation to German, French, and Spanish available, and you can access it um, down there uh, uh, at the little globe at the bottom of the screen. I hope you can find it. If not, you can, um, you can ask um, for direction in the chat. Um, Thank you in advance for the translation team. You're always doing such a good, very, very tremendous job. Um, and many thanks also to the organizing team, Naida, Jana, Edna, and Deria. You are the architects of this amazing discussion series. And for that, I am grateful. Um, I would say 
Uh, now on to our panelists. Um, welcome three ladies that I get to uh, introduce today. I have, I'm very honored to introduce all of you, um, starting with Daniela, Daniela Drandic. Um, he has been the head of the Reproductive Rights Program at RODA, Parents in Action. It's the largest parents advocacy group in Croatia and the region since 2012 um, that lobbies for the protection of uh, women's rights in pregnancy and parenthood. Um, Daniela's experiences of obstetric violence, abandonment of care and rights violations have fueled her passion to improve maternity services and rights in Croatia and beyond. She's a member of the Creation Ministry of Health's Working Group on the Baby and Mother-Friendly Hospital Initiative and serves on the Board of Human Rights in Childbirth. Daniela lives on the northern Adriatic coast with her partner, where she's currently joining us from, and um, her three children, and her youngest was born at home. Maybe we have some time to talk about that today. <laughs> Welcome, Daniela, to the panel. Uh, next Thank up you. is Dr. Mandy Mangler. Dr. Mandy Mangler is Chief Physician for Gynecology and Obstetrics at two Vivantes hospitals in Berlin. She's also a professor for midwifery sciences, an author and consultant to companies operating in medical tech. Mandy is also committed to the promotion of female experts in health with her popular German language podcast, Gyncast. Uh, she brings gynecological topics to a broad audience, helping to break taboos and raise awareness. And um, next week on June 13, um, Mandy, uh, you will receive the Berliner Frauenpreis, the Berlin Women's Award um, for innovative education on women's and girls' health and more equal rights in medicine. Welcome to today's panel, Mandy. Thank and you. Last mm -hmm. but not least, uh, Kaveri Mayra. Kaveri Mayra is a midwifery, nursing, and global health researcher from India. She currently works as a consultant with the country's leading public health organizations, Public Health Foundation of India, where she has been involved in research and implementation initiatives on health systems, human resources for health, nursing governance, nurses industrial action, gender, and universal health coverage over the last two years. While working with PHFI, she has conducted fieldwork in India, Bangladesh, and Thailand. Kaveri was recently recognized as one of the 100 Outstanding Global Midwife and Nurse Leaders by Women in Global Health, um, WHO, International Council of Nurses, International Confederation of Midwives, Nursing Now, and United Nations Population Fund to mark the year of the nurse and the midwife 2020. Um, Kaveri also, like Daniela, serves on the board of Human Rights in Childbirth. I think it's safe to say I'm surrounded by three uh, very, very brilliant um, panelists. Welcome to all of you. Um, Daniela, I would like to start off with you. You are on the board of Human Rights in Childbirth, as mentioned. Um, it's a leading charity organization focused on protecting women's human rights and maternity care. Um, Kaveri is too. What exactly are my rights when I am pregnant and giving birth? And how do human rights apply to birth care? This is a very complex uh, question, but also a very simple one. And I think that in its most basic answer, we can say that you have the same rights when you're pregnant and when you're giving birth that you should enjoy in the rest of your life. In its most basic, you get to decide what happens to you when and how. The more complex part of that answer might be all the things you need to make that happen. That means that you need to have good information to make good decisions. You need to have support a decent place to get care and give birth, and generally everything you need to have the best health possible. I love that. <laughs> it's, a, it's a very concise answer. Um, and Kaveri, if I have these birth rights, right? And if my birth rights have been disrespected, um, we call this, or you call it in your circles, someone has been objected, subjected to obstetric violence. Um, for those who are unfamiliar with the term, because I was also unfamiliar with the term before I kind of read up on um, the entire, um, well, the entire topic, um, 
Uh, it's obstetric violence is the abuse of women and birthing people during pregnancy, childbirth, and the postpartum period. And Kavari, your work um, focuses on, uh, on obstetric violence. It's a very undocumented and unspoken about global issue, right? It, it, it affects um, almost everyone. So what are some forms of obstetric violence um, that women and birthing people worldwide are subjected to? And do you also know who faces the highest risk? Um, thank you for that question. Um, yes, there are different kinds of uh, ways in which someone can be disrespected or abused. And in fact, all these, there are so many terminologies, even though my, uh, you know, I usually talk about obstetric violence when I talk about it, it can be called just dehumanization. People um, call it mistreatment. So whatever these different terminologies are, it end of the day, it is um, actually a form of abuse. And um, similarly, there are different kinds of typologies as well, where people differentiate between the kinds of abuse. Um, the one that I have mostly uh, been using in my research and advocacy is something um, based on like a very uh, systematic literature review from 65 countries. It was done by uh, Megan Boren and team, I think 2015 um, or around that time. And that kind of breaks this down into main seven categories. That includes your physical abuse, your verbal abuse, even sexual abuse as more direct forms of violence, but it also takes into consideration discriminations um, and um, systemic uh, abuse and um, lack of uh, rapport between uh, the care provider and care seeker. And it breaks it further down to like specific uh, acts of violence, like a, a slap, a hit. Um, it talks about even rape and all of these are based on evidence that has been found in those 65 countries. So what I had done with this was try to adapt that for India because that's where my work majorly uh, focuses in. But it's, it's very smart to really look at any of these typologies and look at the context of um, our own country. And sometimes if it is as diverse as India, then um, regions, districts, states to see what exactly violence looks like in general. And very often you will find similar form of uh, violence in the birthing space as is seen in um, an intimate uh, uh, space or in a domestic space or um, in a societal space. So, so it's very much based on what women and birthing people go through in general in their lives. And sometimes it's more pronounced um, in particular people's uh, you know, uh, lives, depending on their background. It could be their level of education. Um, it could be whether they are married or not, if that's an important factor in a society. It could be um, the age at which they are uh, giving birth. If it is if the person is too young or if the person is too old, um, that could be, you know, they could experience certain comments, um, certain verbal abuse that is related to that. Um, it could be about some uh, specific castes as that is common in India, but depending on what that societal segregation in, is in a particular country, it could be dependent on class. I mean, end of the day, it's, it's a lot on gender and sexuality anyways, but there are basically these different kinds of background characteristics and where as somebody um, one is, located the intersection of all these things like race and um, many other things that makes them less and more vulnerable to experience that kind of um, abuse. Thank you. Um, just a follow-up question. If you were to describe someone who faces the highest risk, who would that be? Is it someone extremely young? Is someone who's living? Um, where does this person live? Perhaps, you know, to give a little bit of a more concrete um, example of someone who we should be thinking of when we think about obstetric violence and um, the, those affected the most? Um, you know, there is no way, I don't think there is a way to find like one specific group just because obstetric violence, as some studies suggest, is so universal. 
And sometimes I go to the extent of saying that almost every person, every woman who gives birth experiences some form of disrespect and abuse and violence when in labor and um, when you know during childbirth and not to not to present this situation as that grim it's literally like a holistic um not a holistic but like a, an experience which includes specific ways of respectful care um disrespectful care and abusive care i feel there are very few births um, now that we are coming across and, and births that are happening in particular contexts like home births where the person has had all the information, where the person has chosen, where the person has had a midwife who's compassionate, where a person has um, a health system which is considerate, where policies um, have taken into consideration not just the person who's giving birth, their uh, uh, value systems and choices, but also the care providers, um, you know, choices and, and rights. So it's it's really so complex. It's 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 very interesting. But but yeah, I don't think it's it's possible to find just one group. It's just sometimes it feels like everyone is getting abused when they are experiencing oh. labor and birth, particularly. Daniela, and not all those, not all people receive access to those rights um, equally, right? Um, how are they, how are birth rights implemented in human rights frameworks um, worldwide? Can you give us a little bit of an overview? Um, where do we have which rights? Um, I think what Kaveri said really does paint a picture that, you know, just like any sort of gender based violence, obstetric violence really does happen to women everywhere and in all situations and in all societal groups. However, there are certain groups in certain countries. So um, in groups that a country has othered for any reason. Um, and here we're talking about different forms of intersectionality and othering. So if you are part of a group that's racialized or that speaks a different language or that is rural or that is just othered for any reason um, that, that could be, you're perhaps slightly more likely to be discriminated against and be more likely to experience um, obstetric violence just because of the context of the country that you're living in or the society that you're living in. Um, when we're talking about human rights frameworks, um, the work that Kaveri mentioned earlier by Boren and colleagues really did kind of shake things up by putting everything together that people have been talking about for, for years and putting it together in a very systematic way. So I think that um, events like this today, but also just in general, we're starting to talk a lot more about obstetric violence and about disrespect and abuse in child care, uh, sorry, in childbirth and in pregnancy and postpartum. And just generally, we're starting to include these in human rights frameworks. 30 years ago, we were talking about um, women and babies surviving pregnancy and childbirth. And now we've extended that. So we're saying, okay, you know, we've, in most countries, we've achieved this. And like you said, Sham, at the beginning, I mean, there's still way too many people dying um, immediately because of pregnancy and childbirth. And this is definitely something we need to keep working on. But relative to where we were 30, 40, 50 years ago, we're in a much better place. And now what we're saying is, okay, well, you know, we've, we've improved our statistics about survival, but it's not just about survival. It's about all the other things that include that make um, make family well-being after pregnancy and childbirth and postpartum. So when we put all these things together, we really do start complementing and um, be more a little bit more specific in the human rights uh, framework. Um, it's important that whatever we're talking about, that we always take the intersectional approach and that we look at people from um, other communities or people who you know, are facing different issues regarding access to care. So we can be talking about uh, women and people with disabilities, members of the LGBTQ plus uh, community, racialized women, uh, people from rural and dislocated areas. All these people um, are having more difficulty at attaining and um, achieving their most basic rights. And it's the same in this area. So when we're talking about putting all these things into the human rights framework, we have to think about more than the person who lives in a large city in a well-resourced country. We really do have to trickle it down into all the other areas. Thank you so much, uh, Mandy. Um, respectful care is kind of the antidote to obstetric violence and you are the head physician of two gynecological clinics in Berlin of two clinics that I've only heard good things about um, 
there you make sure that women and birthing people feel respected, dignified, and um, so that they feel that they have agency over their own care. What do you do differently than other gynecological clinics that you've perhaps seen yourself? Yes, um, first of all, thank you. And I very much um, agree with my co-speakers. And I find it very interesting to talk about this issue and this topic. And I think it's very important for women worldwide um, to have a dignified um, situation while giving birth. And I also agree that every birth has the probability of um, being difficult to this birthing woman and that we all need to really support um, women worldwide and it really reflects how we treat birth really or how we treat women and women's health care really reflects our societies so we can directly look at you know vulnerable groups and 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 see um, their societies and and that really re reflects the states and so um well yes i i as a woman myself and as having given birth myself many times i um think i better understand the the whole situation but that doesn't really um, it doesn't really excuse other people who have not experienced this um i think in in germany we have a very patriarchic um approach to healthcare and even gynecology even though you would not expect this is in a very developed country so we have we are um, we are confronted with uh, people who think they can direct women's bodies and they and women's bodies become publicly directed when they become pregnant. So they they they, they no longer belong to themselves, but they they just you know everybody thinks they can decide for this woman and with and and, and over this woman and. This is also true for other situations, of course, unwanted pregnancies, sexual abuse, everything, many, many situations, but also birth. And so um, this makes it very difficult. Also, we come from a point of view where we, as we already said, we're talking about survival of the baby and the mother. So we need to get away from, you know, only surviving um, this situation, which has been very technical. There have been very brutal instruments that have been developed to, you know, focus on the survival of mother and child or uh, survival of the mother if the child could not survive. So there were metal instruments were developed to make sure that more women survived. And I think in, in the context, from, in the historical context, this was correct. This was, of course, what was part of um, the developing obstetrics also. And which it, it was a very male, um, very male m medicine. And now we're coming, we're getting away from this. We, we're slowly giving obstetrics back to the midwives, which was taken from the midwives centuries ago, obstetrics. And now we, and then, it, and then women could not study medicine and or midwifery, nothing. So obstetrics was taken away from them over hundreds of years, over centuries men had men had the, the decisions and and dominated obstetrics which i don't want to you know um primarily reject but it's it, as it has been taken away from the midwives it was difficult so then now we slowly giving it back to the women and to the midwives and we try to um come from a more you know a birthing person centrated point of view so we try to live obstetrics more from the people who are giving birth which is sounds really logical but it's not logical and we get away from all the metal instruments and uh, we get away from all the technicization of, of obstetrics and i think it's it's a bit um zeitgeist um to you know it's it's now easier to be more aware that medicine should be thought out of the perspective of the people concerned which was not um the case for a long time so and i try to you know i try to live a very mm, i try to make birth mm, or i try to put a lot of dignity in in birth because as a process itself medically um, spoken it is a very overwhelming process where you give up lots of auton autonomy uh, autonomy and where you are 
thrown back to your very um to your very instincts in a way and so there are itself in the process you have to you know you you are really in need of people around you who who do not take away m more dignity from you they they need to support you and you know um think in 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 a situation where you might be overwhelmed with feelings pain um birthing waves and everything so so you need to to have people around you who treat you dignified in a dignified way and who help you and who give you strength so this birth will be an in your biography will be a a a situation where we, you remember and which has given you strength and not taken strength away from you and even if in a very medical obstetric way of looking at it with a high um cesarean section rate in our country we can make it a a a a process that has that gives strength to these women and i think no matter where we are in in the world we we will oh, i would like to have a birthing situation where you get, get away and you take strength from this process and this strength can you know reach out into your life and and give you strength and also go to your to, to the next generations of your family people who are traumatized from birth as for example my mother she's been traumatized from my birth she gave it to me and and this went into my birth birth is even you know it's and and it will certainly reflect on the birth processes of my children so this is very we have to be aware of the power of birth also for these women and uh, i think there's too little spoken about this so it's very good that we do speak about it today Thank you so much, Mandy. I think uh, you've uh, mentioned something very important is um, speaking about it, right? And to try and to have um, birth care um, set out in a way that it is done from the perspective of those affected. I think that's the goal, right, Kaveri? You, um, you're talking, I mean, even talking about obstetric violence is a challenge in and of itself, right? Um, in your most recent publication, um, you tried to get women uh, to talk about that. You spoke to eight um, heterosexual cisgender women who've had uh, 20 life births and two stillbirths. Um, and you asked them to describe their, their, their experience. You focused on Bihar state in India. What insight can you share with us? How was the whole process of, of, of approaching this? Um so it's it's part heartwarming every single time and it's very very sensitive to share these embodied experiences of labor and birth and i i used to since i i had seen a lot of um, obstetric violence unfolding when i was getting um, educated as a nurse and a midwife um, the indian version of it um, i had i had seen that whoever i asked about it would usually find it very difficult and because of different reasons there's there's a language barrier in in the kind of um, things that are done the interventions that happen the instruments that are used in our obstetric settings it's also about the body parts that come into play it's in some context very shameful to um, talk about uh, those body parts and in some languages we, we often see that we don't even know that the the language or the words we can use to mention these body parts so every time i will talk to somebody it it I never got the satisfaction of hearing a birthing experience um, where somebody had shared everything to their heart's content. And it was due to reasons of stigma and shame and fear and so much stress and trauma that, you know, uh, is embedded in those narratives. So during um, my doctoral research, um, I, I kind of adapted something called body mapping. Um, and with the same eight women, um, they were from rural uh, villages, they were from uh, urban slums, and the kind of vulnerabilities um, of education, of poverty, of uh, marriage and um, not being married, of age, um, of caste, of uh, skin color, of personal hygiene related issues. So all of these were kind of, uh, you know, there. and. 
I was able to understand um, their experiences through uh, body mapping, um, not just in the, um, in the more respectful kind of uh, manners, but also things that they expected that didn't happen. Um, a lot of these are actually stories of endurance and um, women not necessarily sharing something which is traumatic, but, but using words like disrespect or abuse, a lot of it is just experience and kind of look at it as abuse with the context we see women abused with the literature we know. Um, a lot of it, women um, kind of see that while it is abuse, so, you know, the care provider paid some attention to me because there were so many people. So those kind of things. Um, so it's very interesting to look at how these women actually um, define what is respectful care or define what is just respect to them or uh, define what progress has there been based on their um, sister's birthing experience or neighbor's birthing experience or generational, how their mother gave birth and you know, constantly comparing that while this was my experience, this was so much better than what she went through. Um, so, so that kind of a thing. So this is a visual arts based um, method. And I have seen in my experience that it's usually very difficult to convey violence related um, information and research and to make an impact. But I had very early on seen that when I present these uh, visual, say, paintings or, you know, other forms of uh, visual way of presenting what exactly obstetric violence is, it has been the most impactful rather than just mentioning um, the quantitative percentages or prevalence or evidence um, of particular forms of disrespect and abuse. When I present these body maps, um, people stop and they listen and they feel touched and they are moved to make an impact. They are disturbed. Um, and that is my agenda to, to literally shake them up and make them have a good look at what their health system is like, what systemic racism is like, what kind of insensitive policies there are that is at the, at the root of all these issues to make any kind of progress. So yeah, that's how uh, body mapping and what I call birth mapping kind of comes to play. I visualize it a lot. Thank you so much. Um, Daniela, you've also um, pushed women and birthing people in Croatia to talk about their birth experiences. Um, in 2018, after a Croatian member of parliament shared her own traumatic experience of childbirth, you and Roda um, launched a social media campaign under the hashtag Break the Silence. Um, you were inviting women to submit um, written accounts of their experiences with the Croatian health system. And that campaign was very successful. It was everywhere. Within days, more than a thousand women even um, wrote about their birth experience. Um, was there a pattern in all of those accounts? Um, and what were they experiencing the most? What did you learn from that campaign? In 2018, a Croatian uh, member of parliament stood up in parliament and told her story of a surgical miscarriage or abortion procedure that was done without anesthetic. She was literally tied to a table and her uterus was scraped um, in order to remove the products of conception. This is something she stood up. These are the words she used when she stood up um, in parliament to say this. And just aside from the just the traumatic experience that she had and the words that she used for it, just hearing the word uterus in Croatian parliament for our culture was earth shattering. Um, this unfortunately wasn't the first time somebody had come out to speak about this type of uh, care, but it was the first time somebody at, on such a high level had done it. And it was definitely the first time anybody in Croatian parliament had talked about it. What we did afterwards was we immediately asked women to send their own experiences of similar painful gynecological procedures done without anesthetic. And we invited them to do it in a semi-personalized way by writing their story in short by hand and taking a photograph of their handwriting uh, and their story. We found that four very common and very painful procedures were done routinely in Croatia without offering women anesthetic or even without telling them that anesthetic was possible. In some cases, women were even told it's not possible to even give you anesthetic for that part of your body. So these were things like biopsies, which is when you cut a, literally cut away a piece of flesh uh, for further testing. 
egg retrieval in cases of medically assisted reproduction services, suturing or um, uh, stitching after vaginal childbirth, and surgical abortion. These are unfortunately uh, were regularly done in Croatia and in other countries in the region without anesthetic. Um, the worst in all of it, perhaps, was that people were not told what was going to happen to them, and they weren't told that anesthetic was even an option. So in the case of the parliamentarian, what happened to her was she was literally tied to the table so that she wouldn't move um, from pain uh, before the procedure, and nobody told her that this was going to happen. Um, but I wanted to also go a little bit of a step back just to kind of put people in a frame of what what we're talking about when we talk about midwifery and obstetrics. Um, and Mandy did a really great job introducing that. Um, uh, midwifery is the oldest profession in the world. There is no other profession that's older than midwifery. Women have been with women giving birth since the dawn of time. Um, obstetrics is something that came up let's say in the last 200 years, and that has gained and become more popular. And it's moved midwifery away from being the central kind of place where women receive care um, for their reproductive health. What's an important difference between midwifery and obstetrics is that the midwifery model of care puts at the center that women's bodies are by and large functional, know what to do, need perhaps monitoring help and some support in order to make pregnancy, birth and postpartum safe where the obstetrics model of care, which is much newer, looks at women's bodies as fatally flawed or broken and that need to be saved at any cost. And these are the types of things that we see on television and in films in the Western world, especially where, you know, there's always somebody coming in to save the situation and it's always very dramatic. So I think it's really important just to put on the table and say, you know, there, there's a place for both types of care. They don't, they're not in conflict. They're complementary to each other. And it's important that we use each when they're um, necessary and when they're most appropriate. So I know that wasn't in the question, but I wanted to put that out there. Oh, I love that. Thanks so much. Um, Mandy, now hearing about all this obstetric violence, what, what, everything could happen, right? There's still people who romanticize childbirth, right? I, I have heard so many accounts of people around me who romanticize giving birth and um but it can be a very traumatic experience as we've just heard um where does this romanticization come from and is it dangerous to romanticize it yes um first of all i very much agree with uh, my co-speakers very very true words and very helpful to look at birth from this perspective and yeah, romanticization is one, I think, one part of the problem that um, we put lots of also feeling in, 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 in giving birth because, you know, then we get this child and it's very cute and everything. But I think the more we just look at it as something, um, as a function of our body, which works and which sometimes, as we said, might need support but in the majority of cases it just works and this person who gives birth needs um help for things she cannot do in this situation alone but but she just needs support and um and so this romanticization also is bad for us women because it's it, it takes away our our you know our voice saying that things have been difficult and it kind of neutralizes um, the re reality of, of giving birth so in in the name of love and in the name of romanticization we have to endure all these things and and i think that's not good uh, the more we look at at giving birth as something very normal and very you know realistic and something we will definitely be able to do and we don't need any you know um strange feeling put onto it so we bear everything so then the better for us and and so i think romanticization does not uh, really belong maybe after birth when you look at this sweet baby but the, the whole process i don't know it's just not helpful it also romanticizing when, when when we start romanticizing things uh, when we when we romanticize childbirth we don't think about trans men or non-binary people giving birth. We always think about women giving birth. Yes, and, that's the next um, problem. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. And so a lot of when you when you go into a couple of gynecological clinics, um, sometimes 
I feel very out of space, uh, out of place even because it's 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 catered to the woman who wants to have a child, not to anyone else, not to the woman who doesn't want to have a child, who cannot have a child or to the, as I said, trans men or um, non-binary people <clears throat> that who, who also might have uh, the wish to, to have a child. Um, how important was it for you when you, now that you are the chief physician at those two hospitals, um, those two clinics, how important was it for you to validate other pregnant pregnant bodies, um, those who don't fit the archetype? Yes, yes, it's you know, it's I'm having really difficulties with my um, sometimes with my colleagues gynecologists because you know in Germany we are we are called women's doctors, Frauenärztinnen, so women's doctors, and this itself or no, we call it. Frauenarzt, yeah, the male version, non-gendered version of 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 a doctor. So um, we start with um, having to name the women who are also gynecologists. You know, that's where we are at the moment. We don't talk about the the women in in this in this um, name of women's doctors. We don't talk about the women problem that's also there. We you know we not only treat women. We, this whole binary thing this has caused so many problems to us to us as persons to our whole structure to our um to 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 careers and and the medical system and everything so i think for me it's not a system that really works and i think it's it's also as i said dangerous to us and so i would be very happy if we could leave this binary system and in my clinic, for example, I try to avoid, you know, little babies, they're given for little bracelets and they're either uh, pink or blue. And this is just, you know, it's just a tiny little mosaic of, of things. But this is what our whole society looks like. And I think we are here to develop further and to go, you know, to take the next step and to get away from this very narrow thinking of by of a binary system and to this narrow thinking belongs the the directive um addressing of women's bodies and putting them into you know shapes judging them and telling them what to do and dominating them and this is all this is all very patriarchic and sometimes also male and we think i think we need to get away from this and we of course need to a, a society needs to be diverse and needs to include its members it needs to directly you know when i have a team in my clinic this team needs to directly reflect the society i cannot put um all uh, all and cannot put you know all males or all females into my team it needs to directly reflect the 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 group i'm addressing so and this is very important to me also concerning yeah nationalities and everything everything else so yeah that's what i try to do but i see that um not many people are doing this in gynecology and this sometimes really disappoints me and that makes it really hard for me also because you know i've been looked at as um different and uh i think it's a long way to go and it makes me sad sometimes because i wish we would be further and as gynecologists as we should be you know in the in the front row in, in supporting women and also people who are you know belong to a group that has not a big voice you know only women but all, all other groups that Ha don't have this strong male wh white voice in our society so i try to try to think of gynecology as, as a as a as as something that directly um reflects and strengthens these groups but it doesn't and that's that's really hard to bear daniela um the first questions are coming in for all of you, but uh, I have to add, but um, I have one for Daniela that I would like to ask now because we're because we're talking about, you know, respectful care and safe births and you had three children and you have five. <laughs> so both of you have have experienced birth yourselves quite often and Daniela, your youngest was born at home. How safe is giving birth at home? That's one of the questions that um, came in. 
Um, well, I do have three children, but before I had my third, I had a miscarriage, um, which in my particular case was a very empowering experience, which is very kind of strange. You don't usually hear that when you hear the word miscarriage, um, but it involved a very caring um, doctor and a very caring uh, nurse in this particular case who were with me throughout the whole process um, and really respected all my wishes throughout the process, helping me to have a physiological miscarriage which meant that we left my body to do its work um, as much as it could. And when we needed help, if it needed help at that point, we only intervened. And in my particular case, the intervention was very small and it was very quick. And it was the type of process that I really wanted to have. I stayed at home with my family. The miscarriage was a very normal miscarriage. It was sad, but also beautiful at the same time. When I became pregnant a few months later, a few years later, um, I realized that this is the type of care that I wanted to have for my birth as well. But the problem in my country is that midwives are not a normal part of the healthcare system, which means that if I needed a transfer to a hospital, it wasn't so easy to do this transfer. And that made the birth less safe. So I had a very uh, qualified midwife. I had a midwife who had a lot of um, equipment and all the medication and things that she needed to make the birth safe but I didn't have the system around me to make the birth as safe as it could be in the what if situation. In my particular case, the birth was normal. It was a little bit long, but other than that, everything was fine. And I gave birth to a very healthy um, now uh, little girl who's six years old, but it should have been safer. It should have been better in that I should have had the backup of my health system if I needed it. And I didn't have that. So I think my experience is in, a, is in line with what we see in the literature. And that is home birth or birth anywhere is generally very safe if you have access to higher levels of care in the case that you need it. In my particular case, that would have been difficult, but thankfully it wasn't needed. And that was my risk. I was willing to take that on. But that shouldn't be something that women are risking on a regular basis. They shouldn't have to. Yeah, thank you so much. Mandy, you're also, I had a question for Kaveri, but she, um, it seems like she, her internet connection am, probably kicked her out. <laughs> yes, no, I'm here. Can you hear me? She's oh, back. Yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes, yes, but I did miss a question if there was one in the last one minute. Uh, no, it's fine. Uh, Kaveri, I, because uh, uh, Daniela was just talking about her experience um, uh, of giving birth at home and she had a very skilled, very qualified midwife helping her through that. Um, and Kaveri, you're a midwife yourself. Um, perhaps, um, could you could you speak a little bit about the how important midwives are generally for self-determined birth like how does midwifery improve healthcare? um to to clarify and give a caveat um yes i am a midwife but the kind of midwifery i am educated in is in india so my degree says um, it's it's in nursing it's a bachelor's in nursing um, but my uh, registrations are both um, in nursing and midwifery. And there is important context in why I'm mentioning this and I'm bringing it out is because no matter how many times I go around the world calling myself a midwife and other, um, you know, thousands and, and lakhs of, uh, you know, nurse midwives like myself who are going around the world calling themselves midwives, there is a need for professional midwifery independent of medicine, independent of nursing, which does not exist in my country, India, at the moment. Oh, I... Midwifery can do for uh, women and other people who give birth, but we do not at the moment have that. We have something called a nurse practitioner and midwife. It's it's a version which is still dependent on nursing and, and we are finding it very difficult to take it out of the crutches of not just medicine, but midwifery. Um, and the more we see these kind of uh, birthing experiences, which are, which, are, which are not satisfying, which are not empowering uh, to say the least, and nothing is close to what Daniela uh, said her experience was, um, we realize the importance of bringing professional um, independent midwifery in the country. Um, it has not been easy, 
but I do see these empowering births in many other different countries um, in the world. And there are some midwives who have, say, um, taken the education in a different country and are practicing independently. And those stories of births of women who have experienced that in India is also very empowering, but then it is limited to a certain class of people who can afford that kind of care. It's not given out, you know, as in, as a part of a uh, public health system. So, so yeah, I mean, um, I don't think there is a straightforward answer to this question as well, because I'm coming from a particular context, but somewhere I have a feeling I know what it is and what it will mean to provide that option to women and women are asking for it and other birthing people are asking for it but so far it has been very very difficult and I don't see it's anywhere um, near that we can provide to women and other people in India at least. I mean also too it's um... I mean, Mandy can probably attest to this, but uh, we also have a serious shortage of uh, midwives in Germany as well. Um, Mandy, you're going to be the um, going to um, you're a professor for midwifery sciences, and you're also going to be at the uh, new. Please correct me if I'm wrong, right? But uh, the uh, where midwives can now go to university and obtain an academic degree, um, you're going to be one of the professors um, there. But yeah, um, but I have so many other questions for you and I see the time, I look at the time, I'm like, okay, I think we need to uh, so, uh, quickly uh, mention a couple of other things because um, um, Mandy, you mentioned a few um, things in the beginning in, in your um, first answer that I would like to go back to a little bit. Um, you talked a little bit about also the economization of um, the whole process, right? And um, how does capitalism affect what kind of birth experience we will have? I think um, we don't put enough focus on, on, on giving birth. So we still, you know, we still need to very um, hardly discuss um, how many midwives can attend one, one birth process. And, uh, you know, there's a, there's, I mean, there's a shortage of midwives, but it's, Basically, also because midwives, they are not given opportunities to really um, thrive and fulfill what they think a, a birth um, in their sense um, assisting the, the women looks like. So they, the structure is not perfect for them. And so they, they keep away from um, working in hospitals because it does not really fulfill them or the way they understand their profession is not reflected in their daily life so they have a very stressful life and they cannot you know do um, attend the ph physiological um, birth process and um, yeah that's 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 one of the points so it's rather you know it's not economization in, in obstetrics doesn't mean that you know the birth processes are influenced so we gain more money but too little money is given into obstetrics in Germany, for example, and, uh, and in many other countries as well, because we don't, you know, also midwifery and, um, and obstetrics and women's health is often forgotten. It's like very small details or bigger details, but then all of a sudden we have a law and who's not mentioned midwives, you know, and all of this. So this all puts in, um, reflects a bigger picture of that women's health is not so important because the people who do the laws and who, you know, have power over um, medical health laws, they are not affected by giving birth themselves. Their women give birth for them and, you know, they just like, you know, attend the process and are happy about the product, but that's all. And so, um, so we need, mm, we need more laws made by the people who are affected uh, by them and and that's uh, people who work in obstetrics but it's of course also um, the people who give birth and and that's about that's the capitalistic thing that it's uh, that it doesn't have the priority it needs and that we do not uh, try to uh, from a capitalistical point of view view we don't put 
energy in this birth process to strengthen women and families because women and families are not so important for our capitalistic society because they sometimes they don't put out enough capitalistic um, output so that so they they're not so important I have a and question. they also don't speak back about it you know they don't have a voice they are not given a voice for the birth process and it's that's uh, that needs to really change mm. i have a i have a question in the uh, in the private chat that i got uh, which i think fits um, perfectly here which is um it's regarding cesarean sections um c-sections um and uh here it says doctors usually men suggest um c-sections instead of natural birth because it is faster um like um you know scheduling a surgery um, so it has become very common. Does that have um, a lot to do with how, you know, hospitals are being run and, uh, you know, capitalistic structures um, that hospitals are, are, hospitals are, like, are run like, um, well, companies? Um, not really. That's not the problem in Germany. We have a, a cesarean section rate from 32%. I understand that there are countries where the cesarean section rate is very high, like Turkey and Brazil and, and other countries also. That's, I don't think that's really the problem. Maybe there are some clinics or maybe some doctors who think like this and they, you know, um, and they don't want to attend a birth process, process that goes on for a long time and they uh, get uh, only half or one third of the money of a cesarean section. This might be possible, but this is not the main cause. I, I think what we mentioned earlier, that we do put too, too little priority in there in Germany is, is um, our problem. Thank you so much. Daniela, I, I felt like you wanted to add to that, right? I was looking for the raise hand button. I don't, ha <laughs> I don't have it. Um, yeah, I think we also have to think about countries where the public private health sector is much more blurred or there's a very strong private sector and a very weak public sector or some form of that. And this could be on a country level, it could be on a region level, it could be on a, on a city level. We have one private hospital in Croatia, one private maternity hospital that has a cesarean section rate of over 70%, sometimes very close to 80% on the national, uh, on the yearly level. Um, and when we look at other countries, for example, if we look at Cyprus, which is also in the European Union, they have a very strong private sector and a very the highest cesarean section rate in Europe. So the more pressure we get from the private system and the more pressure there is for hospitals to make a profit, cesarean sections make more money for hospitals in private healthcare systems. Midwifery care and sitting with a woman for 20 hours or 12 hours is expensive. But in the long-term well-being for the majority of women and from a public health perspective, midwifery care is better. So it's just about, you know, what do we value as a society? Do we value profits or do we value um, public health and well-being? Thank you so much. Um, Daniela, also, we talked a lot about politics uh, in our uh, conversation prior to today's panel discussion. And um, we talked about um, neoconservatism and its impact on birth care, um, specifically because you mentioned that there were outdated practices still being used in Central and Eastern Europe and that neoconservatism was to blame. What, uh, what, do, you, what do you come across? When you, when you try, and um, I mean, you're working on a lot of quality improvement programs and um, in which you give quality indicators for better birth care, you work with the government. What's, what's the response there? I think that my answer is going to build upon what Mandy was saying just recently and what Kravity was saying a few minutes ago. And it's about um, changes that are happening in societies around the world in different ways. But in my society, we're talking about women and other groups that were generally ignored or oppressed that are demanding and becoming louder in asking to have the equal rights as men. Fundamentally, neoconservatism is about, who, about power, who is in power, and who gets to make decisions about people that are underneath them. In the case about childbirth, or just generally when we're talking about women's reproductive health care, it's usually about white men making decisions about if, when, and how women have babies. 
And it's based on the whole idea is based on the women and other oppressed people being passive receivers of whatever somebody else decides is best for them. And we see throughout the world that this neoconservative pressure is growing. As we're talking today, I'm just seeing on Twitter that Poland has started, has officially made a law to have a pregnancy register, which means that every pregnancy in the country is going to be registered and monitored. Why would they want to do that? The reason that they're doing it is because they want to prevent women um, from having abortions and criminalize having abortions. At some point, we're going to have criminalized miscarriages. And it makes us wonder, like, what is the point to this? Is there a public health rationale? Is there a rationale for women's health and well-being? Or is the rationale about putting women back in their place, which is at home with, you know, being passive receivers of whatever somebody else decides is best for them? So across Europe, and again, this is my context, we're seeing more and more pressure from these neoconservative groups. Um, many of them are funded by the Catholic Church. Many of them are, are funded by fundamentalist groups and extremists from the United States. And these are problems that we really do have to start talking about and working to combat. Thank you so much. Um, Kaveri, um, you also talked a lot about the medicalization of the system of care in your paper as well. Um, yes. Could you speak a little bit on that? Because I feel like this, this fits perfectly with what um, Daniela was talking about at the moment. Um, absolutely. And um, I would also kind of connect with what uh, Mandy was saying about this and how cesarean sections kind of fit the schedule. And um, as leading, you know, a country in terms of births, there has to be a lot of scheduling, a lot of fitting into the, uh, you know, obstetrician's calendar if we are to manage that many births. Um, there are studies which are talking about um, more than 90% episiotomy rates. There are, uh, you know, those talking about a very, very high rate of cesarean section. I think up, there are some states which where it is um, up to, you know, 75, 85%. To talk at a more, you know, regular kind of a, a context, because a lot of my friends are those who are nurses and midwives and who are educated in this. And I kind of feel like if we are talking about awareness of rights, these are the women and people who are most aware, um, not just in terms of their rights, in terms of, you know, what these interventions are, when they should happen. And I have feel the least, um, you know, ability or empowerment in terms of being able to say, I do not want to have these particular interventions when I give birth. Most of, I think all of my friends um, who gave birth have given birth through, um, you know, a cesarean section. And it's really quite quite strange to me how if if my friends, if people of my level of education or people who can afford any kind of care, people who know better are not able to exercise their agency, uh, do not have the autonomy to speak up and ask for the kind of experience they want, then who exactly um, will uh, get that kind of care? Um, so yeah, um, like Daniela also said, in kind of countries where the health system is kind of, you know, more privatized, more medicalized, um, it's, it's even, even more difficult. And because we are not being able to provide a more private, a more, uh, uh, you know, respectful um, care to women, most people who can afford they would instead choose something in a you know private healthcare sector, and our private healthcare sector cesarean rates are so absurd. In same states, it will be two percent in public health uh, system and maybe twenty or forty percent in the private health system, and this after very few are declaring what their you know obstetric uh, uh, what their cesarean section rates are or different rates of interventions are. Um, so yeah, so that is that is what we are seeing. We are seeing a lot of diversity in what these interventions are, who is receiving them. And it's not that it's women who are not educated or women who are poor who are receiving more interventions. It's everybody. And somehow it has the definition of good care has become the more interventions there are, the more number of people there are, 
the more you are taken care of even though women know at, at the you know at the core of their hearts that what they're experiencing even if theoretically this is what they thought is good care it's not because it didn't feel good it didn't feel right it didn't feel respectful or satisfying thank you um i just wanted to remind everybody that uh the the q and a session has just begun officially um so if you have any questions just put them in the chat and we'll pick them up um i already have so many questions so i hope all the three of you are ready <laughs> um the next one is um and i and i thought that was a, a very important question uh, martina uh, she writes as founder of the image of birth we know that media depictions do influence birth experiences and its status of birth within society um what kind of images would you like to represent birth um what what should be seen i guess that's what she means um yeah daniela i feel like you want to speak <laughs> Um, I, I think that, that Mandy and Kaveri see a lot more of, of childbirth than I do, but I just like open it up to them, but just two things before I do. Number one, um, when you're looking at stock images of pregnancy on the internet, you know, stock images that you can buy to put on your website, it's always fair skinned, white women, very thin, very wealthy looking. And this is the image that we're seeing projected to us. Um, that, that's not the reality. It's very far from the reality. Um, and the second thing that I wanted to say was that social media in general is very censoring when it comes to women's bodies and especially when it comes to childbirth and breastfeeding. And we have to really wonder why that is. So, social media are private companies that are kind of a public forum, but that are regulated by whatever the company policy is. And currently company policies are, are really, make it really difficult for us to see birth the way that it the, the way that it actually is. But I'd like to open it up to um, midwife and the obstetrician to say more about um, the way pregnancy should be depicted. Mandy, I mean, you're leading two clinics. What kind of images do you work with? Yes, I think it's a very important topic what you address and Daniela also said is the way we speak um, about birth and the way we, the pictures we send out, I do have um, active social media channels also. And I try to, you know, put a diverse picture in there and also take into responsibility um, the whole family, not only the woman. That's another thing. I think it's too often, you know, all the problems are just put into this uh, woman's uh, uh, body or in this woman's uh, place. So it's a, I think birth should also involve the whole family and I try to involve the whole family while I speak and it doesn't need to be you know a mother and a father and a child I don't really see that it needs to be a somebody giving birth and other people helping this person so this is our responsibility and it can be close people can be professional people whatever but it's I think it's you know it should be more a concern to more people and that they have this in in their focus and i very much agree also to social media putting on all those stereotype bodies and images into our head every day addressing us as as uh you know part of this binary white society that's that's so dominant to us and we need to be very careful i try to be very careful which in with what i say with what i you know expect from people what i accept in conversations and it's very tiring for also people who talk to me and um and 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 maybe also a challenge itself but i think it's very important that we keep on doing it because if we don't do it then it's not done it's just you know nobody really cares about about these issues if not the people who are directly affected and they need to be given a strong voice so that we can change things and maybe have a better future but this will be a long very long process we are still in a you know when i look at also feminist medicine which is very rare very very narrow um very little people who really think gynecology from a from from the perspective of the women affected when i look at what they have published like decades ago like when the, when i look at the things that have been published to this um to this context maybe 30 40 years ago it's the same i we can just can publish it 
publish the things that have been published decades ago just today and they're just you know as as um interesting and as important as they have been and the process we have been through is not you know it's not satisfying it's too slow it's uh, too very little aus uh, from our perspective and and this is so this is so very disappointing and so we need to give this a big voice and every chance we can get we need to give this a voice and we need to drag um people to our side to give this a voice and we need to um have men also and families on our side who give this a the priorities that needs that it needs so we can have a better we can have better societies and not women's body who are directed by others and and who are dominated by others thank you Kaveri would you like to add to that absolutely um I have a few points to make um I see a very less representation of for example the global south is completely missed out of um you know these images um, when in global platforms or uh, conferences, international conferences. And um, I often see people from global north, when, when this issue is raised, they, they instead ask, okay, then, then, you know, can you provide some of these images? And that is after, you know, raising an issue that, you know, this is, this is, this is all, this doesn't represent the world. So I, kind of find it very strange to believe that people who are actually, you know, like creating these websites or, or these social media platforms or these pages that we follow, they, they really don't have access to um, images from uh, birth in Global South. And if not, like, is it in this day and age of uh, internet and technology, is it really that difficult? Are people really trying hard enough are efforts really being made or so it's it's I mean um, it's also very passive what I see and I'm not just talking about images because we will from a conservative society you will not see a lot of us putting up pictures of our uh, labors and births up on social media what we see what we get exposed to um, is more of movies, um, or, or cinema, where a birth has been shown. And all the birth that we see, um, not just in say our uh, Bollywood movies or uh, other regional Indian movies or in movies from the Hollywood and other parts, mostly is somebody who's lying down and you know giving birth. And that is what we follow. In fact, some of these images, some of these uh, uh, you know, uh, movies, it's just such incorrect representation of giving birth and, and labor. It just like everything It's just how passive this person is. They present the one who's giving birth as the most passive as possible. So, so I think that is, that is what we have, you know, some of us have an issue with the kind of births that I have seen in my lifetime. And because I'm not practicing clinically, mine has been from my education days and from doing a lot of research, which has involved direct observation of birth, but in mostly public kind of setup, but at different levels of care provision, none of it has been represented in any kind of uh, movie or documentary or any of these social media pages, because that would lead to such violation of privacies um, even if that happened, because choice and consent, I don't think we are working very well with them. So yes, there is so much to do when it comes to, um, you know, censoring these images on social media or just to represent birth in how it, it really is. I, I wouldn't know where to begin, to be honest. Thank you. Um, speaking of um, the diverse experiences um, while giving birth, I wanted to um, acknowledge um, a, a very personal story that someone has shared in the chat. Um, um, she has written, and I'm going to read it out loud. I gave birth to two kids. I had a bad feeling giving birth at home. I decided to give birth at a very good, um, very well-equipped clinic. Um, thinking worst case scenario, I researched and chose this particular hospital, um, a perfect situation to take care of any complications from mother or child. And I'm very happy to have done, to have made this decision. 
Um, she writes, I nearly died during childbirth. I lost a lot of blood and it was a wonder I made it. For the second child, the hospital made extra preparations for me and I'm happy I chose to give birth at the hospital. Some 50 years ago, I would have definitely died during childbirth. Thank you so much for sharing your story on here and for, um, for treating the chat as a safe space um, uh, for that. Um, I have so many other questions that are coming in. <laughs> so I'm gonna quickly go through them just because I don't wanna disappoint anyone. Um, so there's another question, and I guess this, is, this one is here for Daniela perhaps. Um, because you chose to give birth at home. Um, and here, Suman, um, I hope I'm saying this right. Um, what are the situations when clinical assistance is needed for a woman and the child after giving birth at home? What, what kind of situations may arise there? Um, I think that we could have a whole panel on that. Um, but what I think is most important and what has come out of the literature is having very good protocols in place and having well-equipped midwives who have a way of transporting women to a higher level institution. And I think it's also important to notice that it's not just about home birth. It's about women who are giving birth in small local hospitals in dislocated communities. It's about women who live, in my context, on islands and in mountain areas where they cannot get even to the lower level facility in a short period of time if there's an emergency. Um, never, and, and it's about those lower level institutions having the ability to transport really complex situations to higher level institutions. So I think that it's really important to put things in a context that it's not about home birth versus facility birth. It's about really looking at where people are and what services they need to make their reproductive health as good as it can be and to make the services they need as safe as they can be. Um, it's really, it, it's, it's easy to fall in this dichotomy of you want this or you want that. And it's, it's not about that. It's not about where the better place for me or for somebody else is. It's about looking at people where they are, looking at, you know, dislocated communities, marginalized communities, other communities, meeting them where they are as healthcare providers and as policymakers and providing them what they need in that space. Thank you so much. I was muted. Uh, and I see also uh, Rola Yasmin. Um, she's written I don't see why we need to exceptionalize Daniela's um, birth story or use it as a comparison when many refugee and migrant women do home deliveries, not out of choice even. And that's, I think it's a very important uh, comment to share as well. Yeah, it's really important to, to provide the care that those communities need wherever they are. And like I said, it's about making it safe and meeting them with the needs that they, that, that they in that particular situation have. In my case, it was the type of birth that I chose because I have the privilege of doing that. But I also don't have the privilege of saying, you know, I want midwifery care. That's what I can say in my mid-resourced country, that we don't have the privilege that somebody in, in Germany or in the UK might have. Right. Uh, Mandy, I have another question for you. Um, you talked a little bit um, a while ago, you talked a little bit about getting away from uh, metal instruments. What are some alternatives um, or some good practices so it doesn't get violent? Yeah, there are some really, really um, bad pictures from obstetrics a, f a few decades ago and where you know this this woman is basically just put on her back and many people put things in her body and try to get out the baby and try to do things and it's, she's very passive and doesn't doesn't really it's not about her as a human being it's just you know reduced to her functions or to um to you know um getting this baby out and uh, uh yeah it doesn't matter what this woman has to go through so those have been instruments and i don't want to contextualize the situations because i you know it, it, from a historical point of view some things might have been correct and and i don't you know want to judge it from now the from our perspective which is of course more civilized than that but um, but nowadays still there are some some um, instruments left and some some things that are really techni very technical about giving birth and um, I think 
as um, we already said, if we have to, um, if if we have to, if, if we go to go to birth from a perspective that this is something that um, can generate lots of strength from ourselves and can generate strength from the people who are in this situation and they support each other and they communicate and they you know give this person um back some things she might need then this will be um this will be more uh this will be connected to lots more a lot more strength and empowering and a very empowering situation and i just think that lots of births would pro profit profit from this perspective Mm -hmm. And so we could reframe it. Thank you. Um, I think I have a question for both of you, Daniela and Kaveri. Um, Eva is asking, legally speaking, how may autonomy be ensured in childbirth? Um, what do you advocate for when you talk about self-determined birth? Perhaps, uh, Kaveri, you, you can start. Yeah, do you want to start with that, Kaveri, from a midwife's or perspective? <laughs> It's, it's a tough one, to be honest. Um, and I'm thinking of, so in terms of, in terms of legality. Okay, so because we were, I'm going to take you back to the rights discussion here. And we had established that, you know, not, not having a birth of your choice and, you know, all the kind of uh, abuses and disrespects that we have been talking about, they're basically a violation of fundamental human rights. And there are a lot of these instruments which are at a global level, um, which are at country levels, which are in states' health systems and policies as well, that determines what kind of choices one has when it comes to, you know, the kind of birth you want to have. Um, and recently, when um, I was working with, uh, I am working with uh, the WHO headquarters to bring out something called the Essential Respectful Care Course. Um, we call it ERCC. We thought it would be great to include like a module just on human rights because like that is where the awareness, you know, is, is not there. And some of these instruments, I'm not going to go into details of which articles there are, but um, there is the human, uh, there's the Declaration um, of Human Rights, there is um, the CEDAW, there is uh, the Convention of Right of the Child. Um, there is also most recent was, uh, you know, the White Ribbon Alliance uh, RMC Charter, which is the universal, which talks about the universal rights of childbearing women. Now, all of these instruments, they have like these list of articles in terms of, you know, what, what you as a person, because you're a human being, you are entitled to. But then a country decides whether it's good enough to implement or ratify it in their country or not. Many of this then become legally binding. Many of these don't. So I think um, it's important to understand and unbox it a little bit no matter how complicated this sounds, that what exactly are my rights? What exactly are these, you know, UN instruments are saying? Has my country really done enough or is it interested in ratifying those? Are there other uh, regional, you know, uh, instruments that are more valid or are there other similar country level things that are more valid? So yeah, so it's, it's, it's basically comes down to that in terms of legality. Um, because I'm not a lawyer and I do not have that background, um, you know, ask Daniela to add to that. Thank you. Daniela. I mean, I think that was a really, that was a really good answer. Um, and the only thing that I would add is that it's really important to not just to talk about rights as this kind of complex, very um, abstract idea. Rights are the things that happen to you every day and the way that you're treated every day and the way that your society values you um, and people like you. So I think that when we talk about that, we have to really think about, you know, let's look at the budget of my of my national government. Are they putting maternity care as a priority? Mandy mentioned that earlier. Are they defunding, you know, local hospitals and closing maternity services? Are they including uh, mental health care, especially during COVID? I mean, if there's no mental health care after childbirth at this period, I mean, we're gonna have a lot of problems in the next 20 years. 
Um, and, and just thinking about, you know, how was I treated? Was I able to make my own decisions? So really about distilling things into the everyday. Human rights are more than an abstract concept. They're what happens to us on a daily basis. Thank you so much. And I think I just have like one other last question for all of you, um, which is Nicolina um, asked, with more and more countries on a democratic backsliding route, how optimistic are you that women's rights in childbirth um, are improving in the future on a larger scale? Mandy, <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> Well, I, yeah, we, I said it um, before, I think it's, it's a very slow process and that's why I think everybody who gives this topics or these topics a voice is, um, is very good for our society and, and will improve the, the, I think that, you know, from a very developed country like Germany, if we, if we give this a voice that will also be transported like the whole me too debate it will be transported in in other countries as well who might not be as developed because you know when we we can give this the, these, these voices and they, they they need it and um this can be a voice for for women all over the world and for their rights so this needs to be in all countries of course but um, also in the developing countries. So they have to, to raise awareness for this issue. And I think it's a slow, slow process. I don't see like accelerated um, um, improvements. And this makes me really sad. And I try to canalize my energy into, you know, productive things, but it's hard to see. It's, mm -hmm. it's basically gone back also during the last, uh, few few years. Mm. Daniela? I think Mandy's right. Um, as somebody who's been working in this space for the last 15 years, I get really, really frustrated when I see that after 15 years, we're still talking about a lot of the same things. And a very good midwife from the United States named Jenny Joseph, who was uh, one of Time Magazine's People of the Year last year, said to me, but this is a generational struggle. I mean, you can do your part and then hand the baton to the next generation and then it's up to them. And that made me feel a lot better. It took some of the weight off my shoulders knowing that I was just creating the situation where people could take over after me generationally to move you know, things forward. Societal change takes a long time and we have to put this in the, in really in the time frame of, of generations. None of us can change the world by ourselves but together we can create the conditions where the people who come after us have a much um, better starting space than we did, much like the people who came before us did the same for us. Um, so I think that this is very, um, it, it's easy, it makes life easier for, for us who are trying to make these societal changes to realize that there's only so much that we can do, but what we're doing matters. Um, but also to do, as Mandy and Kavadi said, to keep talking about it, to, teach people, to show people what's happening. Because when, you know, to put it at its most basic, have you ever thought about how your mother felt when she was giving birth to you? And how would we want our mothers to feel when they were given? like, how do we imagine that even? How did our mother feel? We would want that she felt respected, safe, maybe a little bit happy, you know, if the process was going well. Um, and how do we want that for our children? What do we want going forward? And if we kind of put ourselves in that very simple frame, I think it becomes quite understandable what some of our next steps uh, need to be, each of us in our own community and each of us in our own way. Thank you so much. I have been told that um, Kaveri has lost her connection. So we might have um, time for one last question. Mandy, I think this is um, dedicated to you. <laughs> um, it's in German and I'll try to live translate it as we speak. Um, in, uh, it's about, well, it's about birth care in Germany and how it's becoming worse. And that with my midwives, um, you know, because of their in, uh, insurance costs, they're being hindered from, you know, from assisting, um, giving birth at home, um, you know, smaller uh, rural clinics are being closed, cesarean sections are, um, there are more and more C-sections being performed. Um, is this something that po the German politics is picking up on? 
Well, yeah, I, I think we have um, we now we have some a little bit of focus because even in, in Germany we were the last ones who to put midwifery back to the you know universities to to study it and um, but sometimes I'm not sure if we just you know if it's just not we we are now more people who address the topic but we are also more people as a society so I'm not sure if just you know the percentage of people like us who were talking about it today is just the same percentage as a few years ago. So I don't know, but um, politics, you know, they just, they react if, if they are put, um, if they are addressed and are put into some kind of pressure, if, if they understand that this is for, there's something useful for them. So this will be the only way they, they will um, help us if they realize it could be useful. But, you know, to make childbirth uh, a useful topic to politics that the, the needs to be needs to be politicians who like in, in, in the parliament, this, this minister who, who um, talked about it, if politicians are women giving birth, then maybe yes. But, you know, you know, you all know the numbers of uh, women or female politicians, female leaders in all fields. They're very disappointing. Yeah, thank you so much, Mandy. And thank you to Daniela as well. Um, to Kaveri as well. I hope she's going to find her way back. <coughs> Maybe if not, <laughs> I just wanted to say um, thank you to all uh, all three of you. This was a very, um, I think someone has said it also in the chat, a very insightful, very knowledgeable discussion. Thanks to um, all three of you. Um, I just want to quickly also just um, remind everybody that we're going to be speaking again. Our The discussion series um, has not ended yet. Uh, our next one is in um, is on. Now you have to help me out, guys. It's <laughs> June twenty. No, yes. June twenty one. Yes. Oh, you're June twenty. Okay. <laughs> um, and um, it's about uh, reframing reproduction technologies. There are so many. Um, so many of my friends are thinking about uh, getting. Uh, pregnant uh, with different technologies that are, uh, that are available now. And uh, I can't wait to talk um, with you um, about this. And um, yeah, hopefully you, uh, you, know, you you register and we see each other again next time. Thank you again, Mandy, Daniela and Kaveri. And I hope you all have a great day or night, wherever you are. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thanks so much. <laughs>